feels like it was such a long time ago to me that we were observing the queen's um, funeral. Yeah, it was only Monday. I don't know if you feel that way or not. Um, I, I've been asking a question uh, a, a few times over the course of the week, and that is, why do we do what we do? And, and it started with this. It started, you know, why, what motivates, why would 250,000 people gather on the lawns of the long laneway that leads into Windsor Castle? They got up early, some of them traveled great distances. Uh, why, why, do we, why do we do that? Um, I took in, you know, as much of the, the, the festivities, festivities as I could. Um, you know, I, um, oops, there we go. Um, I um, uh, didn't get up at four in the morning for the funeral, but I did watch it at 10.45, you know, that night. <laughs> um, uh, I did see, you know, the interment. Um, you know, wh- why do we make these choices? And as we've been grieving, um, why are we, uh, why were we compelled to do that together in the ways that we, that we would? Uh, I've been praying, in particular, that the, the scriptures that were read, that the songs, the beautiful songs that were sung, uh, that the gospel, that the, particularly the, the, the Bishop of Canterbury uh, shared, uh, would be heard. Uh, there's a reported like 1 point, or 4.1 billion people that actually took in the funeral. That's a lot of people who heard the gospel. And so I've been praying that there, there'd be fruit from that. Uh, why, do we, why do we do what we do? What, what, some people, in answer to that question, have said things like, well, I, just, I wanted to be there to honor uh, the queen, honor her legacy, because she's meant so much to me and to our world. Um, others have acknowledged that they themselves were grieving, and that by being present in some way was to bring a, a, find a sense of, of closure to the grief that they're experiencing. Um, those are our honorable ambitions, um, the desires, you know, and then there are some that are maybe less honorable, you know, the, the, rag, mag, the rag mags and the, uh, the journalists that are looking for some kind of opportunity to, uh, to make money off of whatever controversy they can dig up in the middle of it all and who wore what and didn't do this, you know, it's, it's like, you know, and, and how, do, how do you find sin in the middle of something that should be so lovely, you know, that it should be so pristine? Why, why do we do what we do. Um, I realized this week that I had told a lie. Um, you might call it a little white lie. Uh, minimizing, you know, saying that it was this when it was really that. But a fear attached to the decision to say, uh, yeah, that's only this. No, it's really that. Um, uh, why, why do we do things like that? I, I, I confess that I talked to the person involved and, and they forgave me. I, I talked to God about it. He forgave me. Thank you, Lord. And, and, and yet, don't we ask the question, why would I do that? That was silly. You've ever told a little white lie? No, it's just, just a little thing. Um, no one's gonna get hurt. Have you ever done something noble because it would make you feel good. Um, when, when we talk about sin, we tend to talk about the big stuff, the disasters that happen in, in our world. Um, and, and yet, we're gonna talk this morning about the reality that the little stuff matters too. And in fact, the little stuff is really, really important. But, but we like to talk about the big stuff, right? The, the murderers, the rapists, the dishonest media, the politicians that we perceive, whatever. You know, we look at sin, we look around the world, we look at those engaged in, the, you know, the human, human slave trade. Uh, you know, we look at the exploitation of the poor, the exploitation of the, the land, the exploitation of religion. Whatever is exploitable, it seems our world is going to find a way to exploit it. We, we look at those who seem to be maneuvering for power, threatening war, executing war, we're under, under false pretense, thinking about it, or pointing our finger at it. But the starting point of sin is far less obvious and seems far more innocent. It started with a couple of naked people, honest people, innocent people, transparent people, who doubted and then rejected God. And from what seems to be such a small beginning comes such a horrific end. The Apostle Paul, he would emphasize it uh, this way. He would say, I I don't really understand myself. For what I want to do, uh, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. So if, 
if we're going to understand sin, this why question, uh, we're going to have to go back to the beginning. Back to this, this place where the scriptures unpack some foundational pieces for us, footings upon which the world has been built. And it's in this ancient account that we actually were introduced to the how and the why of sin in our world. At the dawn of time, the first days after God created, human beings doubted and rejected God. I'm gonna read it for us. Genesis chapter three. I'm gonna read it, it's only 24 verses. I'm gonna read it all. Um, I'm gonna read it from the New Living Translation if you're gonna follow along digitally. Um, But this is the word of the Lord. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her, so she took some of the fruit and ate it. And then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they, they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. And then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, it was the woman you gave me who who gave me the fruit and I ate it. Then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed. More than all animals, domestic and wild, you will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live, and I will cause hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth, and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. And to the man he said, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree, whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grains. By the sweat of the brow will you have food to eat, until you return to the ground from which you were made, for you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. Then the man, Adam, named his wife Eve, because she would be the mother of all who live. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his his wife. And then the Lord God said, look, the human beings have become like us, knowing good and evil. What if they reach out, take fruit from the tree of life and eat it? Then they will live forever. So the Lord God banished them from the garden of Eden and sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. After sending them out, the Lord God stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. And this is perhaps the saddest chapter in the entire Bible. It's a tragic account of how sin entered God's pristine world. And it's it's gonna lead us eventually to Jesus, the second Adam who undid the finality of the damage. But I'm afraid if we don't linger in this for a little while, we're gonna miss the significance of it. So this morning I wanna invite you to, 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 to consider three questions. And I wanna suggest that they are questions to ask 
when you experience temptation. Questions to ask when you you face some degree uh, of risk in compromising your, your faith, in compromising your witness. And the first question is this, they, they come from the text, and I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, number one, am I doubting God? The second question, am I judging God? The third question, is my wanter broken? That's gonna require a little explanation. But, but, but they are in the sermon notes, in the back of the sanctuary, or you can download them. And here's kind of the, 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 the biggest piece in this. The, the degree to which you know God is the degree to which you will trust God. And and then perhaps the biggest question of all, do you know him? Do you know him? My cell phone number is up here. I'm gonna take questions. I'm gonna teach for about 20, 25 minutes. And then if you have a question, you're welcome to shout it out here. That's kind of the most expedient way. I have an iPhone. Apparently, they're slower than Androids. Um, And so the questions last week came a little slow. Um, uh, But do what you can. But if you're online, send me a message, text it into me, and I will do my best to give you a 30 to 60 second answer to something maybe I haven't touched on it or or you'd like to know, you've wondered, uh, related to what we're talking about this morning, uh, would be helpful. Um, and, and then if I can't answer, if I don't know the answer, I'll get back to you this week, or if um, I need a little more time, I will get back to you this week, and I'll, I'll do my best to respond. So, so there's the number there. You can text me, um, iMessage me, um, or stand and shout it out to me. Um, am, am I doubting God? So this question comes from the, uh, the very first verse of chapter three. Did God really say Now that seems like an innocent enough question, right? Like that's the kind of question we encourage uh, you to ask if you're in a Bible study or if you're in in a life group with with someone else. Um, uh, Did I read that right? This this seems kind of strange to me. I'm not sure I understand what it's saying. I I once heard someone say that this means and, and then kind of fill in the blank. Is that true? Did God really say that? Am I understanding the text correctly? Great Bible study questions, life group questions, not what's going on here. And it becomes quickly evident, the serpent's second statement makes it clear when he says, you won't die. That's a gutsy move. No, 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 no. God got this wrong. That's what he's saying. Have you ever doubted God? I have. Now, now let's be careful to differentiate. Asking questions about the scriptures is not doubting God. Trying to understand something that is confusing that you've, that you've read in the scriptures or that you're trying to make sense of in our world, that's not doubting God. That's using your intelligence to try to hear accurately what God says in his word and, and apply it rightly in your life. When we doubt God, we question the character of God, if not his existence. Did God really say that? How could he? Right? And yet, we've been introduced to, to the first sort of foundational pieces of who he is. Genesis 1, he, he, he is, he exists. He, 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 in the beginning, God. He created everything, therefore everything, and everyone is answerable to him. He speaks he is good and he creates good things. He is triune, the one, one God who exists in three persons. And then he's relational within the Godhead and among us as human beings. He, he desires to be in relationship. And the serpent has the audacity to, to counter at least two, if not three, of those, of the, of those statements about God. The, 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 the fact that, did you hear him rightly? Did he, sp- he surely didn't say that. Oh yeah, he's a God who speaks. And, and then to question the goodness of, of his words. That God didn't really say that? What, like, wow, are you sure? Like that seems very unreasonable, don't you think? And then the serpent was challenging not only the what of God's words, but the goodness of God's words, and then he's challenging, he's getting at the heart of, of, of 
even the relational nature of God. You, you gotta look a little bit, pay attention to catch this. Maybe you remember that the last Sunday I pointed out that in chapter one, God is Elohim. It, it's translated God. In chapter two, we get very personal, and it's Yahweh Elohim. It's Lord God. It's the personal name for God who's being used. But we get to chapter three, and when Satan is, is tempting, it's just God. It's, it's, that, it's that step removed again. It's not the personal name for God. It's gonna be used when he's describing uh, the curses bringing, he gets personal again. It's very personal, it's very real. But there's, there's separation here. And, and it seems to suggest that, that this lie is cutting at the very heart of, of, of what he said, the goodness of what he said, and his, his relational nature, that he would be in relationship. There are several ironies in the text. I'll point out a couple of them as we go, and one of them is right here. Because if the, if the woman had thought, apparently Adam was with her, if he had thought about all of this, each of those three lies would have been exposed. Did God say? Yes, he did say. Heard it myself. Is God good? He's, is God good? Are you sure that this is a good thing that he has said? Oh, yes. Yes, I know he's good. Look where I live. Look, look who he's given me to live with. Is God relational? Are, are you sure you want to be clo close? He's not. Keep distance. Well, actually, he walks with me in the cool of the evening in the garden. Um, uh, we have a, an intimate relationship. Now let's be clear, if, if you're going to trust God, you, you've gotta get to know God. We, we live in a culture that, that many would say, well, I don't trust God. If I believe in him, I don't trust God. I certainly don't want to attend to what he says. And, and, and then if you were to ask them, well, tell me about the God you don't trust, they would begin to describe something that really is, is unknown in the pages of scripture. Because the reality is that throughout history, man has imagined God in his own image. We, we, we are inclined when we try to think about who God is to project on him our own weaknesses, our own failures. He, he must be like us, you know, or maybe it's the best of us, or maybe not so much. We, we imagine him to be fickle and uncertain. You look at the way the, the gods throughout history have been described and they're often capricious and, and, and vengeful and suspicious. We may make mistakes, errors in judgment. We, we make decisions without enough evidence. Well, that must be true of him as well. And, and of course, it leads us to doubt him because who could trust a god like that? The degree to which we know him is going to be the degree to which we trust him. And this is, this is faith. It's not a blind leap. It's an informed step into, well, here's how the, the writer of Hebrews puts it. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So, so that confidence, that assurance comes through knowledge of him and our experience of him, okay? It, it, it comes through our knowledge and our experience of him, divinely imparted, him meeting us, enabling faith, and practically engaged, us learning to walk with him, journey with him. He gives faith, and, and we then are responsible to work with him in growing faith. A lot of years ago, um, I was convinced to go rappelling with our youth, our youth ministry. Um, and uh, the rope was, was secured, um, uh, and there, harness was on, all that was fine. But then you, you were required to step back to the edge of the cliff until you're on the very precipice, and then lean back into the abyss. I tell you, that was terrifying. It was terrifying. Like, put your entire weight and your entire confidence into this harness. The idea is you have to kind of get your feet. Yeah, there I am, there. That's, yeah, that's a Getty Images thing. That's, that's not me. Uh, but, but, the, but the idea is you have to lean back far enough so that, so that your feet hold you against the, the rock so you don't smash your face on the granite. 
It, it defies logic because you are absolutely and utterly dependent on the rope and what it's secured in. And that's faith. Uh, faith it must be secured in a reliable object. And if we don't know him, if we don't know him, how do we trust him? And, and, and if we add just another little element to that analogy, we would say faith is maybe like the rope that's secured in him. What we're secured in matters, but it's a living rope. The, the more we lean on it, the stronger it becomes. The more we experience of him, the more we are able to trust him. The serpent invited the woman to doubt God. The rope won't hold you. It's not attached to something secure. And that was a lie. The degree to which we know God is the degree to which we will trust him. And I'm inviting you to ask three questions when you face a temptation like, you can't trust him, doubt him. I'm doubting God. And, 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 and if you find yourself in a place where it's like, I think I am doubting God, then, then either you don't know him well enough or you're forgetting what you do know about him and you're invited to remember. Either way, they don't come with condemnation. They come with invitation. Come, get to know me, and then you can trust me. And that's what we do when we gather for worship. We worship is an act of remembering the greatness of what God has done. And in remembering him, our faith is strengthened. We're gonna to come to the Lord's table this morning. It's an act of remembering what Jesus has done for us. And in remembering, our faith is strengthened. Am I doubting God? Second question, am I judging God? Now look at verse four. Listen to what the serpent said. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. So, so, so this is building on the idea that you can't trust God, but even more so, it accuses God of holding out. He's holding out on you. There are good things out there and God doesn't want you to have them. He knows, he knows what's gonna happen when you eat this fruit and he's holding out on you. And this is a lie, it's an accusation against the character of God and it's a, it's a lie that Satan has been telling since the dawn of time. We, 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 we see it even, it's remarkable how, how capricious and mean the gods of this world are that, that have been imagined up by human beings. When be, human beings imagine God to be in our own image, the gods end up displaying, it seems like the worst of humanity. It's, it's humanity at large, uh, the Greek pantheon of gods, uh, the Roman pantheon of gods. Oh my goodness, what a mess they are. Um, before the Greeks, the Babylonians had their versions of the gods. In fact, there's some interesting parallels to some of those other ancient Near East regions to what we have in the resurrection of Genesis. Some of it, in fact, said, well, Genesis is just copying those. No, no, no. There are really interesting things going on here. One is the story being told that we're reading seems to predate in New Metal uh, the epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, it, seems like, it seems like the Genesis account is, is speaking to them responding to these other worldviews. And if I'm right that Moses has is, is at least got a significant hand in this and that he's writing to prepare the children of Israel, the Hebrews, for stepping into the promised land, that not only is he addressing the gods of Egypt, where he was trained, where they spent their lifetimes, but he's also addressing the gods, these, mis, these misrepresentations of who God is from, from the, the Chaldeans and the Akkadians, these ancient peoples that had lived around them that were influencing the people into the land where the Hebrew people were going to be going. If you're gonna come into the land that I give you, this space, this new Eden, if you will, where I'm gonna, I'm gonna invite you to represent me in the cathedral of the world in this spectacular temple in which I have placed you as my representative, well, well then you need to represent me accurately. I exist, I create, I speak, I am good, I, I am triune, I wanna have a relationship with you, and you, you, you are unique 
Genesis chapter two, you are responsible. I'm giving you responsibility that's significant and meaningful, and you are relational with one another, and I want a relationship with you. I want a relationship with you, says the Lord God Almighty. And all of this flies in the face of the lies the serpent was speaking. Did God really say it? It sounds really unreasonable. You're not gonna die. You'd be like God. He's been holding out on you. Uh, I mentioned that the, the ironies that are present here. Uh, one is they already knew what God was like. He'd been revealing himself. The other's right here. You will be like God. We already were like God, right? They knew that. They'd been made in God's image. They were to represent him in this world. They, they, they were even commanded to fill and to govern and to reign. Man, humanity does not look so good because we so often fail to remember the things that God has already spoken to us. Now, the act of judging God, am I judging God? So am I doubting God? Am I judging God? The act of judging God is to place ourselves above God, and humanity has been doing this over and over and over again. We'll read some accounts as we work our way through more of, of, this, of this book. But we elevate our logic, we elevate our intelligence, we elevate our, uh, our development above him. Our, we elevate our logic. If God, if, if I were God, I would and we fill in the blank. Uh, any God worth following would obviously only ever, and we fill in the blank. We've elevated our logic. We elevate our intelligence. It was fine for people to think that way way back when, but we have evolved. We know better. The turn of the last century, lots of, lots of writing, popular writings carried that kind of theme. Uh, of how humanity was evolving and this pristine world was being developed and, and it resulted in the First World War. How about them? How advanced is that? Um, we, we elevate our, our, our logic, we elevate our intelligence, we elevate our development. Look at the things we've made. Uh, look, look at our genius. Aren't we brilliant? Uh, look at our science, look at the things that we understand. And, and we end up standing in judgment over God. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Oh, you know, the world would be a much better place if you knew a little more. If you, dis if you could discern good and evil for yourself, you don't need someone else to tell you. You can figure this out on your own. It's not a new lie, and it takes a different variation in each generation, but it's a lie that gets repeated time and time and time again. You can manage this on your own. You don't need him. Am I doubting God? Am I judging God? And, and then this third question, is my wanter broken? And the answer, of course, is yes, absolutely it is. The real question is, am I paying attention to my broken wanter? Am I aware? Am I aware? Look at it here in Genesis 3, verse 6. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful, and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it, and then she gave some of her to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Isn't that crazy? Like here they were living in the garden, they were living in paradise, and the only thing denied them is the one thing they find themselves obsessing over. <laughs> It's the nature of a broken wanter. You ever went car shopping? You, know, you, you, know, you look around, you wonder what it should do, and you start doing some calculating, and you know, what can I afford, and you know, uh, what's the best vehicle for what I need, and, 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 and then you, you, your heart kind of ends up being given to one idea, um, uh, and, and then you can't not see those vehicles on the road repeatedly. Um, uh, and, and, and if you're not exercising self-control, if you're not ex exercising good judgment and sound financial management, uh, before you know it, you can be owning a vehicle that you can't afford. It looks nice. <laughs> but my wanter wanted it. Broken wanters 
lead to all kinds of devastation. Broken wanters lead men with lovely wives to want another woman and to violate their marriage vows. Broken wanters lead people with tens of millions to want hundreds of millions. Broken wanters lead powerful people to want more power and disturbed people to inflict more pain on other people, to dominate, to control, to subjugate. And it can be simple as this. Broken wanters, I mean, I can't leave the Amazon page without buying something. I can't leave Walmart or Costco without a little something more. It begins with little, little things, little sins. Unchecked, they become big sins. She saw it was beautiful, some, it would taste good. She wanted the wisdom. The apostle John describes Genesis 3, uh, verse 6, like this. 1 John 2. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. It it describes it, the physical pleasure, everything we see, pride in our achievements and possessions. More literally, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the sinful pride of life. Oh, God, help us. Because unfortunately, John goes on, he says, anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. And we say, but we can't. I know myself well enough. I'm not perfect. But there is one who has and is. And his coming was anticipated right here in Genesis 3. In in this account of of what has come to be called the, the fall of humanity is the beginnings of the promise of the redemption of humanity. In in the very words, at the very same time that God was cursing the serpent, and notice, when God curses the serpent, he once again uses his personal name, Lord God, Lord God. As the Lord was cursing the serpent, he's offering the first hint of a solution that he himself will bring. Verse 14, then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling into the dust as long as you live, and I will cause hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. And there's only ever been one who could and did crush the head of evil, and his name is Jesus. The writer of the book of Hebrews puts it this way. Because God's children are human beings, Made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Apostle Paul says basically the same thing. He he puts it this way. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. That's cool. The victory over sin is something that did happen through Jesus. And it is something that is happening every time you and I make the choice to trust rather than doubt. To submit rather than stand in judgment over God. Victory over sin happens every time we choose to redirect our wanter to the most beautiful, most delicious, greatest ambition in our lives. With God's help, we must redirect our wanters towards Jesus. Yes, I want that, but I want him so much more. Now, let me take questions. I probably haven't, there's so much in this. I probably haven't scratched everywhere that you might have itched. Um, So shout it out. Text my, the number on the screen. Um, What haven't I touched on that you've wondered about and you'd like to talk about? I'll give you 30 or 60 seconds. It won't be a complicated answer, but uh, it will be an answer if I can. Anything? Sure. Do you think God knew that they were going to sin, or do you think that he expected them to be perfect? 
Do I think God knew they were going to sin or did God expect them to be perfect? Um, this is one of those categories of questions that, that I think we wanna be really careful with because we're trying to understand God's motivation, like, like what's behind the text. And, and we don't always get that. In fact, often we don't get insight into that. And honestly, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I think I could read for days and still not come up with anything better than, I don't know. I'm not sure how we're supposed to think about that. He made a perfect world. He is all-knowing. I th- I th- he must have known that they would fall. Um, and, and then how does a perfect God exist in a world? There's a whole bunch of philosophical questions that spin out. What we're called back to, and this is part of the point of the foundations, is, is this idea that, that, that he is good. Like there are these things that our rope must be attached into, and then some of these conjecture questions, these philosophical questions that come. We, we're welcome to think about them, um, but I bring them back in submission to the things that are, are clear, that are, that are evident. I, I know that really doesn't answer your question. I'll think about it a little more. If I think of a little more, Adina, I'll... Another question? Yeah. Right. Uh, that's a great question. When God drove man, Adam and Eve, out of the Garden of Eden, how is he showing that, they, that he loved them? Um, and, and there's probably several answers to that. One is he didn't slay them, so there's grace in that. But the other would be um, he put the angel to guard the garden. I, I believe the point of the text toward the end of what we read there where it says that um, uh, if they reach out, uh, now that they've eaten from the tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil, if they reach out and take the tree of life, they'll live forever. And, and I take that to mean, like, be stuck in this, in this state of, of sin forever. So, so let's keep them from that, and that's an act of mercy. And I think the other act of mercy uh, and, and, and demonstration of love is the promise right there in the cursing of the, of the serpent uh, that uh, he's going to make a way, that, 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 and I'm gonna talk about that in a couple of minutes as we come to the Lord's table. Um, if you have other questions, you can send them my way and I will do my best to respond. Um, uh, listen, to, listen to this. Um, Paul writes in Romans chapter five. Uh, at worship team, if you'd come and join me here, that would be great. Um, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness, for all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. John in his gospel writes this, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. He goes on to say, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, Satan bit his heel. Dr. Don Carson writes this. In in the language, take and eat, which Christians recite at the Lord's Lord's Supper, It is impossible not to recall the former use of this pair of verbs, she took and ate. So simple the act and so hard the undoing. Someone has said, God will taste poverty and death before take and eat become verbs of salvation. 
If you put your faith and your trust in Jesus, join us in this act of remembering. And in it, be strengthened in your faith. Uh, In it, grow in your confidence in who God is, in his work in you, his mercy, his compassion, and his immense love for you. Because on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread from the Passover table and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat, remembering what I've done for you. Let's us eat together. And at the close of the meal, he took the cup from the Passover table and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sin. Take and drink, remembering what I have done for you. Let's us drink together. And when we take and eat and drink, we are proclaiming Jesus has restored us to God the Father. And we are now those whose lives are telling the story of God's greatness, love, and mercy. We're going to sing in worship, and then we're going to go and we're going to represent him. Let's stand together.